Lord Bentix English Education Act 1935, the teaching of English language and literature to the Indians, and the Bengal Renaissance Act. We will discuss the emergence of Indian English novel in colonial British India in the 19th century. Uh, so in the third part of the lecture, we will refer to a few Indian novels in English of 19th and 20th centuries, more specifically the first half of 20th century of 1950. Uh, uh, this is the scope of the seminar. Uh, yes. So uh, in 19th century, uh, we will refer to very briefly the novels, a journal of 48 hours of the year 1945 uh, by Kesida, the Republic of Odisha by Kesida, um, and then uh, Sunkur, Sunkur, Kesida, uh, okay, and Hawking Chan, uh, Chandra Chatter's Anand So, in the 20th century, we may refer to uh, Arun Chagos, the Moon and the World, Bhara Bhairi, and Kantukla Radharao, Unsearchable Monster Dhanan, Waiting for the Mahatma. I don't know uh, whether we will be able to cover because I was told to cut out the lecture because we are already late. Okay, no problem. Then very briefly, I will uh, refer to the three uh, parts of the lecture. Anyway, this is the Abstract of this lecture, and then briefly I will go to okay. So now, promoting uh, the discourse of nation, huh? um, okay. The negative effects of colonial oppression give post-colonial view its anti-colonial perspective. Is an obvious manifestation reached a climate during the independence struggle and the achievement of political freedom. The historical fact of colonial oppression still exists under different forms of forms in contemporary society. It was impressed by the ideological ideologies of colonialism. Tagore talks about the paradoxical nature of nation. I'm referring to like I am quoting him uh, in his essay Nationality, he says. While the spirit of the West marks under its banner of freedom, the nation of the West forces its iron chains of organization, which are the most relentless and unbreakable that have, that have uh, ever been manufactured in the whole history of man. The Western concept of nation, which is critically uh, examined by Chago, and this is uh, the third kind of concept. Um, is really unbreakable and uh, we cannot accept to, uh, all the ideas of Western concept of notion. So, uh, yes, today in India, the evil, evils of caste system and poverty perpetuate the process of decolonization. Civilists understand that countries and people have become effectively decolonized to various political, commercial, and military operations and interests. Chagor disapproves of such an organized mechanical power of a nation, with its emphasis on strength and efficiency, undermines the idea of human creativity and diversity in the essay nationality. So in his novel Countdown, Amita Bros points out the issue of a nation state's appropriate appropriation of its people within the force of its organized ideologies. India as a nation has often been a contested notion and a conceptualization. Arthur Chatterjee holds India seems to be a paradigmatic example of that very modern phenomena, an emergent community which is uh, founded by Benedict Anderson, whereby large numbers of people came together to consume the political and cultural uh, entity known as the nation. So he further explains that nationalism in India is a derivative European nationalism, a different discourse, yet uh, one that is dominated by another. So, however, the nation state of India today is a recent construct, a result of historical accidents and political transformations that occurred over the 19th and 20th centuries. Despite the relative newness of India, the modern nation it has, however, been a home to various peoples, communities, cultures, languages, and religions. So, going back, back to colonial and pre colonial times, we can also have the uses of nationalism 
In the third century BC, the emperor also ruled over the entire kingdom of Bharata. Uh, referring to Mughal times, we understand that the rulers ruled over the land across the Indus River and called it Hindustan. So the historical perspective. And then uh, later this region became the cultural center of both the Hindus and Muslims. Uh, Sudhir Kabira considers that India is not an object of discovery but of an invention. It was historically instituted, uh, instituted by the nationalist imagination. India seems to be a paradigmatic example of that very modern phenomena and imagine the com uh, community whereby large numbers of people come together to constitute the political and cultural entity known as the nation. So they will never meet or even hear of each other. In the minds of each, uh, leave the image of their communion. So I am putting uh, Anderson here. The origin of Indian nation traces back to the idea of freedom. Liberation movements are influenced by the concept of nation. Self assertion is a vital tool for surviving among nations of the world. That is why Amitabh Ghosh implicitly brings out the idea that bomb is symbolic of political oppression and national pride. So, due to the urge uh, to dominate the colonizer, uh, was scaling down the colonized economically, socially, psychologically, and culturally. Power systems were active for political oppression. So, dear Ambedkar says, I hold that nationalism is at once a philosophy, fellowship for one's own and an anti philosophy for those who are not, those, those who, are, who do not belong to that nation. So, various communal uprisings based on religion were forcing the Hindus to uphold their identity during the 19th century. Ashish Nandi uh, posits the 19th century uh, reforms like Swami Dayananda, Sri Aurobindo, and Swami Vivekananda tried to instill in the Hindus a sense of community as Hindus and as a sense of history as community. This sense of Hinduism had been a challenge to the invention by Western values of Indian culture. The dominant Indian culture has the ability to observe the culture and way of its invaders, incorporating them as part of its own religion and way of life. Before independence, anti-colonialism in the form of rebellion against an imperialistic nation was a form of protest, which formed the basis of nation national construction. All the strands of this rebellion were gathered up into an ideological unity. Democracy in India is protest driven. The ethnic and religious minorities protest against any singular definition of nation. The politically marginalized groups protest um, inadequate representation in government policies. Numerous ins uh, insurgencies all over the country relate their revolt to work for independent at the sub-national level which the, uh, sub, uh, which the dominant national ideology has been unable to either outwit or neutralize. Very often there is a debate that India is not one nation, there are so many nations in India, uh, cultural, cultural nationalism, regional nationalism. So that is there. So, um, yes, in, um, um, uh, imagine community Anderson's uh, words, post colonial nation states have been modeled on colonial patterns. As the native intellectuals are trained in the Western cultural and culture and values. So, Patrick Tataji, in his Nation and its Fragments, uh, talks about formation of uh, Indian nation. He says, nationalism is a nation, a non European context. Um, uh, nationalism in the non European context was historical views with colonial Christian. The nation may uh, partially depend on the Western ideas in the matters of politics, science, and economics for modernization. Nationalism as a cultural sentiment should be fused with emotional attachment, uh, attachment to a politically organized entity. Nationalism includes materialism and spiritualism in Indian context. So, Randit Goa, the who has uh, talked about the sovereign uh, struggles, he is a pagan nationalist. Uh, to him, uh, the dominant ideology of Indian nation cannot hold good to everyone. 
So therefore, the sovereignty struggles are quite different from the national movements in the Western culture. So these sovereignty struggles are based on um, regional needs and interests of the people concerned. So which have richness of cultural diversity. The nation state is a political discourse with an authoritarian stand to be imposed by the nation state. So, um, so the political entity is thought to be the nation, but the cultural uh, cultural focus, so which constitutes the different uh, diverse culture uh, in relation to the different types of people, languages, and regions. So that is very often you know. So therefore, deep, I am problematizing. I am not giving any opinion. Rather, so I just focus how there are so many problems uh, in formulating a specific Indian national ideology. Han Fan, Han, in the age of the art, who is a <coughs> supporter of uh, this anti-colonial uh, movement, he also talks about this aspect. He says national culture, national consciousness should have an international dimension. National culture being collective thought process of people should be at the heart of liberation struggle. National consciousness, not nationalism, can only give the people a nation an international perspective, an international dimension. To solve this post-colonialism, post-nationalism, is post-nationalism that has also an uh, international perspective. So anyway, um, Gandhi has also talked about nation, Nehru, and uh, others. And uh, uh, yes, Gandhi says uh, in his uh, uh, hymns and uh, experiments too. So like Robin Gandhi's idea of nationality is rooted in moral and ethical principle. He wanted self rule by the method of Satyagraha and not violence. In Swarat, uh, his uh, political manifesto. Uh, is uh, talking about the moral rigidity uh, in the context of uh, national objectives. So, okay, problematizing uh, some of the interests uh, which uh, I just uh, discussed. So, we understand that um, the idea of India is very really complex. It is not uh, a simple uh, concept. So, therefore, the concept of the Indian nation should be considered in the perspective of polyphony of its indigenous people spread over the country and diaspora. So, the diaspora and the indigenous writers have their own formulations about India as a nation and culture. As everything is in a flux, the traditions of the nation are also subject to change, uh, changes by the passage of time. So, reconstruction of one's homeland is subjective. As discussed earlier, Marlow and Sai view that the anti colonialism should emphasize the concept of an uh, open minded global community. So, this is the first part of the lecture. I just very briefly refer to some of the thinkers. In the second part, I will also briefly discuss the idea of uh, emergence of. Uh, um, Indian literature and Indian English novel, more specifically, more specifically Indian English novel and uh, novel um, in 19th century. Novel and narration of nation and fiction are often linked. Timothy Brennan therefore articulates nations then are imaginary constructs that depend for their existence on an apparatus of cultural fictions in which imaginative literature plays a decisive role. So Priyamanda Gopal finds that the rise of nation states and the flowering of the genre have coincided across cultural context. Setting aside the vexed question of when the novel as a literary entity can be said to have begun. So in this part of lecture, um, yes, uh, I will refer to the war of modern India after the war of philosophy. So there was part of India. So after uh, yes, um, the East India Company defeated the Nawab of Bengal in the Battle of Panasri in, uh, in 1757. There was facilitating the emergence of the British India. So after formulating the India Act of 1784, the British Crown took over 
political control of Bengal, as well as the Bombay and Madras presidencies, to check the power of East India Company. The region, British India, became the site of, site of struggle for control between the delineating, sorry, between the uh, declining Mughal Empire, the Marathas, and the British, uh, yes. Um, and the British resulting in the mass of modern India. So, with the new maps reflecting Britain's interest and dominion, the subcontinent was seen as an actual region in a meaningful geographical, as a meaningful geographical entity. This imperial territory would eventually become the site of anti colonial and nationalist struggle, um, facilitating the emergence of Indian English novel. Which narrated, uh, which narrated the idea of modern Indian nation. So, yes, in this uh, context, I would refer to two um, philologists, uh, British philologists, William Jones and Nathaniel Alhead, um, because they had uh, done a great contribution to Indian literature, uh, Indian. Um, nationalism. Okay. The first phase of British rule in India, late 18th century, was orientalist in its uh, education policy, combining the initiation of the West to the first literary treasures of the East and the in reintroduction of the natives to their own cultural heritage, represented as being buried under the debris of foreign conquest. Scholars like British philologists are William Jones and Nathaniel Alnett. Learned Sanskrit and Persian and undertook research into classical literary traditions of the Indian subcontinent. All this was the center to the colonial states' acquisition of knowledge and information about those whom it governed. But in the early part of the 19th century, the situation changed because the uh, English um, wanted to introduce their um, education policy. Uh, English, uh, they wanted to Englishize the uh, British India. The nation became the privileged category for demarcating larger political entities and the cultural grouping. The paradox is that despite the newness as political entities, the nation, the nation see themselves as a possessed of great antiquity, with commercial, uh, uh, with immoral past and instigated their natural history. Nation state whose status was, however, not granted to them. It was essential to have a history for inclusion in the club of nations. But all cultures and civilizations were not considered as they deemed not to possess history. G. F. Hegel, the German philosopher, in his lectures on the philosophy of world history argued that world history found its highest expression in European conceptions of reason, freedom, and the state. Letting these concepts, China and India, were outside world history. So, though India had a pleasure of spiritual achievement of profound quality, it, in the opinion of Hegel, had no history. The, this influenced the colonial discourse which justified regarding uncivilized, uncivilized people as not entitled to the same rights. Indians were branded as uncivilized people and therefore they had no right to certain things. Modern, um, okay. Another um, historian, British historian of course, the Hegemonic historian Mill, James Mill, uh, he had written 10 volumes of, of history books, A History of British India. So, so he argues that India, the Hindus, uh, which includes the Hindus, is a false claimant to nationhood because its claim to antiquity and historical records are fabricated. There is no point in reading the Hindu legends because they present a mass of unnatural fictions in which a series of a series of real events by the means of uh, uh, by no means be traced. The fabrications of all Hindus, uh, fabrications of the Hindus are in poetry and the language of poetry 
being fossilized cannot be the vehicle for historical truth. Mill therefore dismisses uh, William Jones' admiration for the Hindu Sanskritic tradition as a result. There would be arguments whether British India colonial, uh, uh, in the colonial times would adopt Oriental education or English education. So now that so they decided to bring and uh, to make um, India Englishized. So then, as all of us know, the uh, winners of uh, Makayale, so where he says, whoever knows that language has ready access to all the vast intellectual um, wealth which all the wisest nations of the earth have created and uh, hoarded in the course of 90 generations. It may safely be said that the literature now extend in the language is of uh, is so far is so far um, have, uh, is so far is of having greater value than all the literatures which 300 years ago were extant in the languages of the world together. This is the argument of Matale and uh, therefore he says but actually the intention of Britishers um, was to create some certain class of people who are um, Indian in scheme, but then, um, but in um, in uh, behavior, in thought patterns, they will be the English. So the history of colonialism, uh, the history of colonialism also of course the history of colonial subjects, and then with the resistance, the famous uprising of 1857, which generated a, me a myriad um, sensational, sensational English novels, were despite its uh, on top a large scale, no exception, armed revolt was endemic in all parts of early colonial India. At the same time, collaboration was also an element of colonial rule as native subjects engaged with the new power structure in their own self-interest. They occupied lower level administrative posts, participated in commercial ventures, and enrolled themselves in educational institutions. Colonial policy and education shifted and changed in relation to the response to its subject who get the ideas of their own and how they could benefit from new education national initiatives including the English education. So the, um, yes, so I am referring to that, the, uh, what Michael has said, a class of a class of women the interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons, Indian in broad and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. Okay, so that is how they introduced the English education in the 19th century, beginning of the 19th century. And uh, this English education was a great factor in revitalizing and uh, bringing in the Bengal Vinasa. Okay. Bengal Renaissance. So there, um, uh, yes, if Bengal, uh, the Bengal, the intellectual intelligentsia, the Bengal intelligentsia is a class of people who were bilingual, native middle class, Hindu middle class, and uh, in 793, uh, the British introduced permanent settlement, and the uh, rich people of uh, Bengal they came to Calcutta, though they had the uh, vast property in. Um, villages and uh, this class of wealthy people, they were, um, they came to engage in politics and also literature. So both of uh, both the things, and uh, they were known as the uh, new urban elite, Bhadra Loko, respected people. Okay, they were branded like that. In 1817, uh, there was the establishment of Hindu College of Calcutta, an institution of English. Western learning along with the orthodox Hindu hierarchy. So that means English values, uh, English education, and of course the um, Indian values will not be um, given up here in this institution. So Dasudra Bhakti says there is an integration of Englishism and Orientalism in this institution. The idea for Rinasa, yes. So because of this Rinasa, the Hindus, the middle class Hindus, the intellectual, so they rely, the middle class rely that 
uh, Indian has a vast civilization and a great culture, but they could dare to uh, counter this. And how to counter? So that they could these novels that we will discuss uh, very briefly, of course. So we will go to that. Uh, there is no time. And uh, Henry Delogio, a young um, a, a young Hindu lecturer who spearheaded the movement of this Bengal, uh, in a, uh, the young Bengal movement. And uh, Michael Madhusman Dutta, his student, uh, was also um, a great uh, poet and uh, he also contributed a lot. And uh, this is a power of middle class. In colonial India, based less on economic power, they were rich people, but it was less in economic power, more on their abilities as cultural entrepreneurs. They derived the resources from Indian cultures, Indian heritage, Indian tradition. So that is their fight uh, to um, indigenize our Indian nation. They have the ability to define history, modern and India. Because uh, Hegel and uh, Hegel argue that Indian uh, Hegel and that uh, Amil, the uh, British historian, they say that India had no ability to write in prose. They have no history. So therefore, these people uh, wrote in prose and they wrote uh, the history of India also. Another young man, Asi Prasad Bose, a young Hindu scholar, wrote an essay attacking Mill's history and defending Hindu chronology. Uh, and uh, he discovered that India is a nation with its own history. Those histories and the bark of novel so coincided, uh, coincided and it was a response to intellectual domination of uh, dominance of world history. Actually, this was a response to intellectual dominance of world history. A particular paradigm of storytelling to another rather than from fantasy to reason and need of history. Because they challenge uh, us, uh, that is why, uh, yes, I am quoting here. Uh, Priyamanda Gopal, so he has, he has written a uh, very good and Indian English novel. So, so as, uh, she says, and so it was the, that the novel emerged in the 19th century India with a profound interest in the writing of history and uh, related no, no, in it? articulating a sense of nationhood. So, this concern was particularly visible in the Anglophone novel written at the time with a mainly European reader and interpreter in mind. Um, okay, so this is, uh, as we shall see, at no stage was such a paradigm shift either complicated decision, uh, refreshed elements, wonder, fantasy, poetry uh, would emerge through the gaps in even many solidly, uh, uh, solidly real, realistic works and of course over time. Magical realism or uh, the bringing together of the fabulous and real would come to be one of the most celebrated achievements of the Indian uh, tradition. Prose realism, the novel, all were appropriated and reward rather than simply limited and so this is uh, I from I come to the conclusion of the second part of the lecture. And now uh, I will read to some uh, novel very briefly because we have no time. Uh, Okay, just kind of I was told. Okay. Uh, then this is the third part. So, where I discuss some of the uh, novels that I told you. So, eight novels I have told you, but I will not uh, reflect on those novels. Let's read, of course, I will uh, finish in five, ten minutes. Uh, um, it will take more time, but I am not going to go to the things. Read the one hour paragraph. Because of the time, I was given one hour, so that is why even I prepared that same word. Anyway, uh, the first Indian novel in English, uh, a journal of 48 hours of the year uh, 1945 by Swaraj Chandra Dutta. Published in 1835, uh, much before post colonialism took a formal step set as a theoretical practice, this short narrative text represents the injustice of uh, subaltern oppression and uh, prophetically uses the word subaltern. 
in its present postmodern sense. This one merit to drop out the multi tensions of the Bengal British cultural negotiation. It was simultaneously implicated in the process of indigenous identity formation and in the formation of subaltern consciousness that takes not only suggests armed conflict as a tool of the opposing colonialism, it is also prophetic in its uh, use of the concept of the subaltern as far back as 1835. So about 150 years before subaltern studies were formally uh, started eh, in India. So okay. So this is the uh, novel and I have to just refer to other uh, give me some time because uh, otherwise it will be incoherent but I wanted to tell so that will remain incomplete eh? so just uh, Yes. One thing I need to search. I'm going to the last part. I think they have a question. So, Indian literature is not a theoretical co uh, coherent category. So, every book written by an Indian inside the country or abroad is part of the thing called India, Indian literature. It, it, it is uh, said by Jay Amor, all of us know. It compares many different languages and different traditions. This literature has emerged from within shifting cultural boundaries over the centuries. The commercial outfit East India Company defeated the Nawab of Bengal, so, and uh, then uh, modern India was born, and we um, found that uh, in 1835 the novel, uh, the first novel was written, and Sankur is, uh, uh, is another novel, a tale of the Indian cuisine of 1857. In contrast to the imaginary narrative of Odisha, the Republic of Odisha, I am not going to that novel, I am going to a novel of 1857. Uh, Sankur is, however, a full fledged novel of rebellion. Written by an Indian um, in relation to Sipai Mutina of 1857. The opening chapters relate to the issues of uh, India, uh, India and Hindustan. The crowd revolt around the question who will rule India if the British are overthrown. So, in the early sections, the novel follows the structure of a mutiny, novel depicting treacherous and cowardly natives plotting the downfall of their uh, British uh, overlords. The narrative gradually shifts towards the mischiefs of the British. The Englishmen in India do not feel in common with races they have conquered. There is no sympathy on one side and no confidence on the other. Two British fugitives, Bernard and Mackenzie, with their insolence, hypocrisy, and cunningness, betray the trust of their rural force by raping the Indian woman who has given them centers in her home. So it is very fine uh, to, um, yes, uh, to note that the racial logic, uh, note the racial logic is shown to justify the rape. They say there is no harm in that when the woman is a nigger, you know, it would be a different thing if she were a European. So this kind of thing, so I'm not, uh, I'm just going to refer to uh, that novel very briefly uh, and come, come, coming to the conclusion. Uh, Sankur, uh, this novel, uh, Sankur uh, remains uncomfortable while he thinks of the sufferings of the masses. Uh, the Habildar, however, suggests the old mother raped to go back to Surajpur, so her home, and forget the bloody doings. Sankur also wants to withdraw from the rebellion and uh, thinks of uh, returning to the village. So the private story of Sankur and the story of the mutiny uh, are uh, decent angle. That is how the novel ends. This is the uh, novel. So I was referring to. So and then I am coming to Anand Mathur. Uh, just briefly I will tell. Eh? So because of uh, misrule of the British widespread 
uh, finance and economic degradation in the first decades of 9th century. Uh, there had been large scale resentment and uh, criticism against the British rule. Various uh, provincial groups united themselves into a more well defined nationalism under the large uh, All India umbrella. Subsequently, in 1885, Indian National Congress was established. In 1905, there was a significant demand for Swarajya, a self rule. The novel had now established itself in Bengali, Marathi, and other Indian languages and provided a site for exploring the meanings of nation, national culture, and national, uh, nation group, and national identity. The most important novels in India in a language during this period from Chandu Menon, Malayalam, and Govardhan Ram Tripathi, Gujarat, and to Bengali, Swakim Chandra Chatterjee, and Ravindra Tagore were educated in English and were deeply influenced by the European novel. Both Anand Bhatt and uh, Anand by Bhankim Chandra Chatterjee and The Home and the World by Ravindra Tagore originally written in Bengali uh, and uh, written translated into English explore India, uh, India and Indian nationality. So uh, Anand Bhatt and uh, Boom um, and uh, yes, what? So these two novels, perhaps uh, I will do. And after that, uh, if you permit, I will go to uh, the 1940s, 40s, and 50s. So where I, I want to refer to Anthopra, Malpaya Dhanan is untouchable, and I can also wait for the Malpaya. Maybe I will skip that, because uh, I will just uh, finish here. Uh, uh, OK. Yes. Anand? Please give me five minutes, I will finish these two novels. Huh? Okay. So, Anand Bhatt returns to the mode of a fictional history uh, we encountered in Sankar, imagining a rebellion against a tyrannical rule, but at a careful uh, historical distance. Uh, in Sankar, anti national rebellion against tyrannical rule was a response to specific incidents and injuries with only a national invocation. Hindustan Bonkins to a novel Anand Water, how that delineates uh, in uh, Bonkins, um, the novel Anand Water, how it delineates a visual India that becomes iconic India, mother India. An enchanting image more beautiful and glorious than Lakshmi. I'm quoting from the text Lakshmi of Saraswati, who is she? The mother, who is the mother? The monk answered, See who children we are. Priyamanda Gopal observes drawing an existing Hindu conception of the Mother India uh, as, as a female and as a goddess, the image of Mother India became a powerful point for Indian uh, nationalism and freedom struggle and a persistent theme in literature and popular culture in India. So, Anand is said about a hundred years before uh, its uh, time. Uh, um, uh, a publication of its writing during a famine in 770 when Bengal was not under British rule and the region of Birbhum was under the rule a uh, rude and incompetent Muslim ruler Mir Jafar. So who was uh, supported by the British in the first uh, band of monastic sons, sons, sons of India, they were to liberate their mother from the bondage um, uh, from the bondage. So, Mahindra, Divanand, Santi, and many others join their hands and uh, lead a massive uprising against the Muslim ruler. Subsequently, the Muslim rule was destroyed, but Hindu rule has not been established. The British are powerful enough to counter the Hindu movie. Uh, the anthem, Bande Matram, uh, uh, the national song that we say now, uh, the uh, Bande Matram insert into the novel's narrative. Is a powerful assessment of militant nationalism. Chatterjee rebels, uh, Chatterjee rebels fight in the name of a Hindu mother nation to root out the Muslims completely. Priyamanda Gopal Ojit, as the Bhadralogo are respectful Bengal intelligentsia of Bengal began to search for their national identity in the period of the Englishness, they turned to a presumed indigenous Aryan or Hindu heritage as the true Holy Spirit of the Indian nation, uh, now uh, degraded and overlaid by centuries of Islamic rule. 
So now I am coming to the next novel by Rabindranath Tagore, Who and the What? Let me briefly have this one. One minute, huh? because that is the last one. Huh? Huh. And uh, so I will just uh, go to the last one. Okay, I am coming to this. Uh, yes, Who and the War with a key text, conclusion, okay? Key text, experimental in form. Uh, structured as a series of interwoven monologues, drawing also on the author's capabilities as a dramatist and poet. It is Tagore's controversial and critical engagement with nationalism that makes the text as having continuing relevance. Tagore is quite sympathetic to the character Nikhil. There are three characters, important characters Nikhil, Bimla, and Sambhi. Multi perspective novel that is why I am referring to it, and I will stop there. Written uh, in 1916, I just talked the uh, 20th century. But actually, the, the lecture has been preferred up to 1950. Uh, keep in mind of this uh, seminar, okay? But I am not going to that. Um, okay. A uh, dialogue is quite sympathetic to the character Nikhil, although he gives the three protagonists almost equal voice at the time. Nikhil articulates his authors own despite with militant nationality. So this has been figured here as a destructive and tyrannical and therefore a derivative of the discourse of violence of colonial power itself. Tagore philosophically utters uh, while delineating his lectures in Japan and United States of America during 1916 after getting Nobel Prize in 1913. So even though from childhood I had been taught, he says in a lecture uh, I have been taught that idolatry of the nation is almost greater than reverence for God and humanity. It is my conviction that my countrymen will truly gain their India by fighting against the education which teaches them that a country is greater than the ideals of humanity. So if our country people think that uh, we are, uh, will we get our freedom by thinking that our country is more than uh, more important than the humanity, then I don't want that kind of nation, uh, freedom. That is what he said at the end of that, in that novel that he read, uh, in that lecture that he has said, uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, Nikhil is a true, yes, I am coming to that last part. Something here symbolizes muscular masculinity. Militant nationalism as a derivative discourse of colonialism um, from the West. And he embodies particularity in contrast to Nikhil, a true indigenous alternative and universal in its humanism, not to hate others. Tagore critic, Tagore's critic of militant nationalism is complex, insightful, and radical. That text ideological structure is not stable. The ending of the novel is disturbing and ambiguous. The last line. So, yeah, Dimra with the wife of Nikhil, but now she has developed some relationship with uh, Sandeep, and uh, because of his uh, uh, aggression, militant uh, nationalism, she has come outside of the inner circle. Home and uh, war. Home and war. Outside uh, home. She is operating outside home. A woman is brought out of the home. Okay. So, Bimla is the side for an interpretative contest between two men over the meaning of nation. The novel is an exploration of crisis of masculinity that are, the, that are then enacted against the figure of the desirable and desiring woman. It is seen, not Sandhi, who embodies Swadeshi nationalism and does so in marked sexual terms. My side, the quote from the novel, my side and my mind, my hopes and my desires. He can read with the passion of this new age. Okay? So, now this is where I am stopping. Uh, also, I skip many things. And the next, uh, my, uh, uh, the next part of lecture, uh, we will take a quick 50 40 minutes. I will not do that. And it is related to the novels um, which have um, been influenced by Gandhi, Gandhi ideology. More specifically, I have taken three novels here, Antutra and Unbridgeable uh, uh, and that was waiting for the Mahatma. So I am not going to those things because of the 
problem. Okay, now I can prove. I listen here.